As we continue through the Lenten season, we continue our meditations upon our Savior's sufferings and how he willingly went to the cross to gain for us salvation. Let us pray. Jesus, I will ponder now on thy holy passion. With thy spirit me endow for such meditation. Grant that I, in love and faith, may the image cherish of thy suffering, pain, and death, that I may not perish. Grant that I thy passion view with repentant grieving, nor thee crucify anew by unholy living. How could I refuse to shun every sinful pleasure, since for me God's only Son suffered without measure? Amen. We sing hymn 358, Lamb of God, we fall before thee. Please follow the order of service as it is printed in our service bulletin. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions but we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake, renew us by your spirit and lead us in the way everlasting, amen. 
Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven with boldness and confidence. We may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, please hear the desires of your humble servants and extend your right hand to defend us from our enemies. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. For our Old Testament lesson, we are reading through the prophecy of Isaiah regarding Jesus' sufferings and death. And so we read another portion of Isaiah 53 this morning where it speaks of Jesus as the one who silently, who quietly went forward to bear our sins on the cross. In fulfillment, we think of how Jesus stood before first the Jewish council and then before Pilate and Herod while many false accusations were thrown at him, he stood silently accepting that, that burden of sin. We read from Isaiah 53, beginning with the seventh verse. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. We continue our reading of the Passion history as it is compiled from the accounts of the four, ev four evangelists. If you're following along in the Christ of the Gospels, we're picking up on the middle of page 190. We are reading of Judas' remorse and the trial before Pilate begins. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt sorry. He brought the 30 shekels of silver back to the high priests and elders. I have sinned, he said. I have betrayed innocent blood. What do we care about that, they asked. See to that yourself. Then he threw the money into the temple and left, and he went and hanged himself. And as he fell forward, he burst in the middle, and all his bowels poured out. The high priests took the money. It isn't right to put it into the temple treasury, they said, because it is blood money. So they decided to buy the potter's field with it for the burial of strangers. That is why that field has, been ever, has ever since been called the field of blood. Then what the prophet Jeremiah had said came true. I took the 30 shekels of silver, the price of him on whom some men of Israel set a price, and I gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. The Jews themselves didn't go into the governor's palace to keep themselves 
from getting on to keep from getting unclean because they wanted to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate came out to them. What accusation do you bring against this man? He asked. If he were no criminal, they answered him, we would not have handed him over to you. You take him yourselves, Pilate told them, and judge him according to your law. We are not permitted to kill anyone, the Jews answered him. And so what Jesus had said was to come true. He had predicted how he was going to die. Then they started to accuse him. We found that he leads our people astray, keeps them from paying taxes to Caesar, and says he is Christ, a king. Pilate went back into the palace and called for Jesus. When Jesus stood before the governor, Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Did you think of that yourself, Jesus asked, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate asked. Your own people and the ruling priests handed you over to me. What did you do? My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus answered. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not of this world. Then you are a king, Pilate asked him. Yes, I am a king, Jesus answered. I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who lives in the truth listens to me. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After saying that, he went out to the Jews again, and he told the ruling priests and the crowd, I don't find this man guilty of anything. While the ruling priests and elders continued to accuse Jesus of many things, he said nothing. Don't you have anything to say to this? Pilate asked him again. Don't you hear all these accusations they bring against you? But Jesus didn't answer him anymore in regard to anything that was said so that Pilate was very much surprised. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. We profess our Christian faith with the whole Christian church on earth. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing hymn number 342, Chief of Sinners. Yeah. 
harps of sea, sing as eternity, love that found me wondrous thought, found me when I sought him not. Jesus only can impart, balm to heal the smitten heart, peace that flows from sin for him, joy that lifts the soul to heaven, faith that hope to walk with God in the way that he knocked wrong. Chief of sinners, though I be, Christ is all in all to me. All my wants to him are known, all my sorrows are his own. Safe with him from earthly strife, he sustains the hidden thief. O oh, my Savior, help afford by thy spirit and thy word. When my wayward heart would stray, keep me in the In time of need, supply while I live and when I die. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon meditation this morning is found recorded in Matthew's Gospel, where we read in the 27th chapter, beginning with the third verse. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. This is the word of God. Sanctify us, O Lord, through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In Christ Jesus, our crucified Savior, dear fellow redeemed, Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, Villain of villains. Judas is regarded by many as the worst of all oil offenders. It is a great insult to be called a Judas. We know a lot about Judas and how the devil wormed his way into Judas' heart and life, and it's not all that foreign from us. It was his lust for money that presented the chink in Judas' armor of faith. And yes, he had been a believer. And this chink in his armor was used at, by the devil at great advantage to work Judas' downfall. Paul wrote to Timothy, The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This was as true for Judas as anyone else in the world. The sin of covetousness and greed had been working its way deeper and deeper in Judas' life. He had been entrusted with the collected funds of Jesus and the twelve disciples that had given Judas the opportunity to pilfer. And pilfer he did. Of course, the word pilfer doesn't sound so bad, does it? He was a thief. Many people embezzle a little bit here and a little bit there, and, and, and they always rationalize it by, well, I'll pay it back somehow, someday. 
or they find some other justification for their acting so sinfully on their love for money. It seems the last straw for Judas prompting such gross sin was an act of love and devotion performed by Mary of Bethany when she anointed Jesus for his burial at a dinner held in her brother's honor, Lazarus, who Jesus had raised from the dead. This dinner was held in Bethany in a man's house named Simon, and she had broken open that box of expensive ointment and poured it over Jesus' head and over Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and Judas was outraged at the waste when that could have been sold, and he would have gotten the money. He went to the chief priest right after that, and he struck the deal to betray Jesus into their hands for 30 pieces of silver. And we know how it all played out, don't we? We know that Judas left the Passover supper early before the others, getting a band of armed men from the chief priests and, and even in his lust for money, encouraging them to take the man securely who he would approach and kiss. He didn't want any slip-ups. He didn't want to lose out on any of that money that he had earned. It all seemed to go as Judas planned, except for the way it all turned out. We don't find Judas ecstatic with glee, counting his 30 pieces of silver. Our text reveals Judas' remorse. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Judas Judas was lost in contrition and remorse. Contrition sounds good. It's like one is on the right track, right? They feel bad. They feel sadness, sorrow over their sin. But this sorrow led to despair. What was Judas thinking, that he didn't see a bad outcome from his actions? He must have thought that nothing really bad could have happened to Jesus. The high council, well, they wouldn't really kill him, would they? Jesus would get away somehow, or they would set him free or, or something. Or Judas just didn't think it all through to its conclusion that the betrayal of Jesus would bring about his condemnation. And then the unthinkable happened. Jesus was condemned. And then deep remorse took hold of Judas' mind and heart. Judas isn't the exception. He is an example of how deceptive sin and Satan can be in luring us luring us into shameful vice. And then what? Judas felt bad about what had happened. He felt terrible that he had betrayed Jesus. He didn't realize that Jesus could be condemned. He recognized that his betrayal of Jesus was sin. But what did that get Judas? All the remorse in the world doesn't undo what one has done or the guilt that one bears. Suddenly, Judas wanted, to do, wanted nothing to do with the blood money he had taken. He threw it on the temple floor. When he confessed his sin to the priests, and without doubt, Judas did go there and confess his sin. What counsel did they give? Did they direct Judas to make a sin offering to God? 
Did they remind Judas of the Passover supper that he had eaten himself just a few hours earlier with Jesus and the other disciples and how that symbolized the forgiveness we have from God? No. They said, what is that to us? You see to it. They failed in their responsibility as ministers in God's temple. They failed by telling Judas, that's your problem. Left without the consolation of the gospel, remorse turned to despair, and Judas ended his own life. Judas ended his own time of grace. His end was eternal destruction. Jesus knew this tragic end was coming to Judas. But Judas would not be turned away from the path of sin that he was on. At the Last Supper, when Jesus announced that one of the disciples was going to betray him, Judas should have been struck with horror. Jesus knows! And just abandoned the entire idea. But he would not be deterred from his sin. Even in the garden, when he walked up to Jesus, Jesus said, Friend, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? He would not be deterred from his sin, so great was his lust for money. And besides, he had already taken the money. How could he turn back? Jesus' words are words of lament. Lament for Judas. We see Jesus' heart of love. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Jesus spoke these words at the table, at the Last Supper. Sadly, that can mean only one thing, something Jesus came into the world to prevent. There is only one end for which it is better that one had not been born. And that is eternal death in hell. We need to know the stark truth about sin. We dare not fool ourselves. Sin brings death. There is no getting around this. We have simple scriptures that anyone can memorize and recall. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins is the one that shall die. Who can't understand that? And yet, our sinful flesh veils this truth so that we, we, it just doesn't seem possible when we're the one that's sinning. Whatever lust it is that takes hold of our, our heart, that, that serves as a chink in our armor of faith, Satan will surely find it and take advantage of it, we may convince ourselves that the sin that we are contemplating will be okay in the end. Everyone will calm down after a while, and it won't make any real difference in the world. And maybe to the world, they don't care. But does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? For the disciples of Jesus Christ, and that is what we are, Jesus' disciples. For the disciples of Jesus Christ who have promised to be faithful unto death, for the disciples of Jesus to willfully sin is to betray the Lord Jesus and to hold his sacrifice, his suffering in contempt. The unveiled truth about sin 
the bare naked truth about sin is that sin brings death, spiritual death, temporal death, ultimately eternal death. And sin is a total and complete corrupting power. And it has stained all of us. We confess, well, even betrayal. Betrayal of our Redeemer in one of our Lenten years. There was no spot in me by sin untainted, sick with sin's poison, all my heart had fainted. My heavy guilt to hell had well nigh brought me, such woe it wrought me. O wondrous love, whose depth no heart hath sounded, that brought thee here by foes and thieves, Surrounded, all worldly pleasures, heedless I was trying, while thou wert dying. And we go on sinning, in spite of how dangerous it is. But by the grace of God, we have not been left in the despair of remorse over our sin. By the grace of we have not been left in just despair over our sin. We have been called to the blessing of true repentance. The veil over the truth has been lifted. The Holy Spirit has called us to faith in Jesus as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And though we in our foolishness have sinned against the Lord and by our sin shown a lack of for the gift of life that he has won for us? Well, the Holy Spirit has led us to true repentance. By the grace of God, we have in our hearts what Judas lacked. By the grace of God, we have this confidence of faith that Jesus forgives sinners. And so we put our trust in him he paid the price for our sins and endured the cross, removing sin's curse, removing sin's shame, lifting us up from despair to hope. He has delivered us from the wages of sin. Death no longer reigns over us. Consider the plight Judas was in. He confessed his sin but was directed away from the cross to seek out his own resources for dealing with his sin. And it led to his eternal destruction. We have been set on a different course. John writes in his first epistle, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess your sins to God and he will forgive. God is faithful to forgive. Even though we fall into sin again and again in our shame, God remains faithful. As we daily confess our sins, God continues to forgive because the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. In the richness of his grace, God established the covenant of our salvation when he sent his son to atone for the sins of the whole world. Believe it or not, there is no doubt that your sin has been paid for. No doubt. Your sin has been paid for. Think of that for Judas. His sin was paid for by Jesus' death on the cross. Yes, even his sin of betrayal. Jesus shed his blood for Judas too. Jesus shed his blood for me. Chief of sinners though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me. Died that I might live on high lived that I might never die. God established this 
covenant of grace so that forgiving you and me daily and richly was and continues to be the just and right thing for God to do. God is just and fair and faithful. And to fail to forgive you would violate his own covenant of grace. He can't do that. He must forgive those who in true repentance confess their sins. When sorrow over sin is accompanied with faith in Jesus as that atoning sacrifice for our sins, there is forgiveness. The Lord lifts us up from the darkness of our sins. He lifts the veil from our eyes that we might see the unveiled truth about sin that it has been taken out of the way by our crucified Savior. Through Jesus' blood and merit, I am at peace with God. What then can daunt my spirit, however dark my road? My courage shall not fail me, for God is on my side. Though hell itself assail me, its rage I may deride. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. O Lord, most holy, we thank you for the love of Jesus, and that in his compassion and grace, he freely gave himself as the sacrifice for our sins, presenting his perfect life as an offering for our salvation. We thank you for the finished work of our Lord, his holy life, his blessed example, his gracious teaching, and his atoning death. Grant us the light of the Holy Spirit so that we may always be partakers of your eternal kingdom. Help us to imitate the example of Christ and to walk in his love. Grant that as children of the heavenly light, we may sincerely repent of our sins, shun the ways of darkness and error, and follow in the paths of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Let your hand, O Lord, rest upon your church to defend it and to make it grow. Give success to all who sow the seed of your word, proclaim the gospel of salvation, and in Christ's name, minister to people's souls. Give faithfulness to us, your people, so that we may work hard at gathering in the harvest of redeemed sinners into your eternal kingdom. Stretch forth your mighty arm to rule and direct our government and give wisdom and integrity to all who are in authority so that our nation may be kept in peace and that righteousness and justice may everywhere prevail. We pray for all who have needs of either body or soul, for all of our loved ones who are in distant places, for all who have strayed from your word, for all who are suffering sickness and pain, and for all who mourn. Pour down your blessings upon them according to their need. Hear their prayers. Comfort them with your presence. We ask all this, dear Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we pray in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Offerings are received by placing them in the basket on your way out of church this morning. And those that are joining us through our streaming services are encouraged to send in their offerings directly to St. Paul's Lutheran Church here at 
2100 16th Street Southwest in Austin, Minnesota. We will continue our service with singing of hymn number 777, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn verse is hymn 151, verse 1. Christ our life above all the living, Christ our death of death our foe, who thyself for me once giving to the darkest depths of woe, through thy sufferings, death and merit, I eternal life inherit. Thousand thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus, unto thee. Amen. Sunday school and Bible class are scheduled to follow after the service this morning, and catechism is scheduled to follow after that at 11.30. Um, Wednesday, we have our midweek Lenten service uh, with our um, soup and sandwich suppers. Uh, the supper begins at 6 p.m., uh, and the Lenten meditation at 7. Um, this, the theme of our meditation this coming week is Christ gave himself a sacrifice to God based on Ephesians 5.2. Also, ladies, note that's connected with that after the service. I'm, I'm not sure exactly when. Um, there's going to be a business meeting of the ladies' aid um, on this Wednesday evening. 
So uh, next Sunday, again, we have our regular worship schedule with worship at 9.30, Sunday school, Bible class, and catechism class following after. Are there any other announcements that should be made at this time? The peace of the Lord be with you all. Thank you.